In their quest for the missing experimental submarine Siren 1, the crew of the Siren 2 discovers a patch of toxic seaweed and an air-filled underwater tunnel. They venture to do their mission there, but end up facing swarms of mutant marine creatures created in a government tunnel laboratory. How will things progress now that their courageous rescue attempt has devolved into a deadly battle for survival? Let's find the answer in the movie. Contact company personnel Jake and his security pay an unannounced visit to Wick Hayes in his residence. Jake then attempts to wake up Hayes so he can open the door for them by buzzing the doorbell numerous times, but Hayes remains sound asleep. Since Hayes refuses to let them in, Jake and his security enter the flat without permission. Afterward, he wakes Hayes up by pouring him a drink as his security opens the blinds and lets in the sunlight. Once Hayes awakens, Jake tells him about an accident that has happened with his designed submarine and gets a jet for DC on standby. Therefore, Jake's announces that Contact CEO Steensland and Barton want a discussion with him. Later, Hayes visits Steensland's office to inquire about the whereabouts of the submarine he designed, Siren 1, which is equipped for deep sea missions. Steensland begins explaining, saying that his initial assessment indicates a total collapse of the nuclear power system on Siren 1. They try to know more about what happened, but lost radio contact. He also claims that Siren 1 probably set down in the deep ocean, waiting for rescue. Perplexed, Hayes requests a brief report about the Siren 1 because he is sure he did not include any nuclear-powered engines in his blueprints. Barton then intervenes, saying that the report indicates it was his structural design, not the company's modification. Steensland even makes it look like Hayes' fault as he says that eight people on the submarine are already dead because of his failed design. Because of this, Hayes attempts to walk out of the office for he cannot afford to hear more blames for something he didn't do. But before he leaves, Steensland reveals that his friend Mark Macy was on board at the time of the explosion, saying that Mark fought just as hard to have Siren 1 built as closely as possible to Hayes' design. Hayes hears it, feeling even more responsible. Now that they prevent Hayes from leaving, Steensland and Barton approach him. Barton then tells Hayes he will join a NATO rescue team to track down the Siren 1 near Norway. It's Hayes' sole hope of clearing his name and saving Mark. They will use Siren 2, the only other submarine of its kind, and Hayes will be relied upon to pilot it as he is the only one with any knowledge of it. Later, at Trondheim, Norway, Hayes enters the Siren 2 and meets the crew's navigator, Anna Rivera. He attempts to shake hands with her, but only receives a cold response and an unfriendly welcome. Afterward, Hayes follows Anna to a room where he meets all the submarine crew. But just like his encounter with Anna, Hayes is greeted with hostility because everyone thinks he is to blame for Siren 1's demise. Then, only Carlo, the ship's doctor, gives Hayes a warm welcome and takes him to his assigned bed. While walking, Carlo apologizes on behalf of the team's attitude earlier. He says that they are still in tension after learning that the mission is secretive and they have no idea of their return dates. So, Hayes explains that he only needs to fulfill his mission and it doesn't matter if the rest of the crew dislikes him. Carlo then informs him that there is no room for a private bunk anymore and hopes Hayes does not mind sharing with Robbins, a recruit crew member. He agrees, and Carlo opens the bunk's door, where they see Robbins vomiting due to seasickness. Then, Carlo excuses himself and leaves Hayes alone with Robbins so that they can get acquainted. Once inside, Robbins introduces himself as a computer specialist and lets Hayes take the bottom bunk. A while later, Felipe wakes up the snoozing Joe Kane and tells him to attend an emergency meeting in the galley because the captain is about to arrive on their ship. In the galley, Captain Randolph Phillips brings Lieutenant Nina Crowley with him and meets the crew. He then introduces Nina Crowley as an expert in biogenetics while Hayes, on the other hand, gets alarmed as he sees his ex-wife again. After that, Captain Phillips informs the crew that they should promptly address them with military respect while on their duty tour. Then, he inquires about the accuracy of a rumor he heard that their crew name NATO means never a thing organized. 
This is because Captain Phillips has noticed they are not in full uniform, notably Kane, standing with his back to him while wearing trousers instead of a proper uniform. Before he leaves, Captain Phillips instructs the crew to report to their stations within five minutes, making the team pissed due to his firmness. Meanwhile, an unknown man sneaks into the control room and alters the computer code. On the other hand, Crowley has a hard time getting through the security door until Hayes beeps the code for her. Then, instead of thanking Hayes, Crowley ignores him and goes inside. This prompts Hayes to follow her and attempts to talk about their relationship, but Crowley quickly shuts down the topic and pushes him away. She tells Hayes to focus on their duties instead of talking to each other. When he is about to reply, Robbins unexpectedly interrupts them to ask for his help running a diagnostic on the turbos. Because of that, Hayes leaves the room with Robbins to see how Steensland's company tweaks his design as he plans to diagnose Siren 2's turbos thoroughly. In the control room, Captain Phillips orders Fleming to take Siren 2 for a test drive, but Hayes intervenes, telling Captain Phillips that he hasn't had a chance to give the Siren a thorough diagnostic check. In addition, he claims that a test drive can't be conducted since they have to travel through highly hazardous seas. The more complexity of a design, the greater the number of potential issues. Given that, Captain Phillips inquires Hayes whether he has found any problems yet, to which Hayes replies negatively. Since that is the case, Captain Phillips gives Fleming instructs Robbins and Rivera to keep a close eye on the sonar. As the visual range is extremely limited at the ocean depths, Rivera assists Fleming on his test drive so they can avoid ice formations. Meanwhile, Robbins reports to Captain Phillips that standby sonar shows projections of ice formations, but Rivera says it is negative. This leads Robbins, overheard by Hayes, to speculate that he and Rivera's navigation is off-kilter. On the other hand, Captain Phillips compensates for Robbins' display to ensure a safe side. Since both navigation systems will return a result of 15 degrees, he gives the order to have Robbins and Rivera continue running a course around and pass through the ice formation. However, their navigation projects a collision course, so Captain Phillips orders a full evasive action. Robbins makes it through the ice formation, even though Siren 2 has already crashed into it. Afterward, Captain Phillips inquires about what transpired, Hayes explains that the navigational design has been modified, stating that the modification rewired the sonar system to make room for a forthcoming missile tracking system. Fleming then interrupts, saying they have never encountered such difficulties with the older submarines. Therefore, Hayes argues that Siren 2 ran into issues because it lacked a sufficient diagnostic check, showing Captain Phillips the changes in Siren 2 on the computer. While showing it, he asks in frustration why Captain Phillips does not want to believe him. This prompts Captain Phillips to excuse Hayes and have a discussion with him in the cabin. But before they leave the control room, he commands Robbins to recalibrate the sonar units manually and give him a damage report later. Inside the cabin, Captain Phillips chastises Hayes for attempting to screw his design in Siren 2 and barred him from entering the control room until further notice. He also replaces him with Robbins in checking the Siren 2 and says Hayes can only assist Robbins via the ship's communicator. A while later, Captain Phillips returns to the control room and hears Robbins' damage report, learning that the computer system prevents itself from gathering additional radiation data. Confused, he seeks Crowley's advice and is told that a non-nuclear source likely created the contamination. Meanwhile, Kane draws Captain Phillips' attention to the computer, showing him the beeping sound it just makes, which Robbins interprets that the device is following the black box signal. Eventually, they discover that the black box signal decodes Siren 1. This prompts Captain Phillips to get Siren 1's black box, which is 27,000 feet below them. As the Siren 2 descends, he commands Robbins to activate the high-intensity searchlights, wherein they see seaweeds. Because of this, Crowley informs Captain Phillips that photosynthetic organisms cannot occur in ocean depths and requests a sample to study it, being curious about how it manages to live without oxygen or food. On the other hand, Robbins reports to the crew that the sonar readings show metallic debris close to the rift's outer edge. He assumes that it might be a significant structural piece from Siren 1, so 
Hayes asks for Captain Phillips's permission to let him do a comprehensive damage assessment in order to find out what went wrong with Siren 1. Captain Phillips permits and then calls Sven to suit up. Afterward, he orders him to get Crowley a seaweed sample outside, then photograph Siren 1's wreckage for Hayes. Upon venturing outside, Sven finds what he considers to be the source of the seaweed, a jet stream of warm water originating from below. But Captain Phillips tells him to ignore those and proceed with his task. Therefore, Sven immediately cuts the seaweed sample and gives it to Felipe. After that, he starts taking photos of Siren 1's wreckage when suddenly an unknown sea creature attacks him. Felipe asks for Captain Phillips to assist Sven but gets rejected. As a result, Sven doesn't survive. However, Captain Phillips is unaffected and still proceeds to retrieve the black box. As Siren 2 dives into the rift, the crew detects a huge strange thing that will collide with the ship. Alarmed, Captain Phillips orders Fleming to bring up Siren 2 3,000 feet to avoid it while Robbins provides external cameras to identify the strange thing. But it's too late. Siren 2 already hits it and great damage is caused wherein the engine room starts burning. Due to this, Hayes takes immediate action to cool down the burning heat with a fire extinguisher. On the other hand, the control room crew finally identifies the strange thing, which turns out as enormous seaweed. Since the computer system is down, Hayes suggests that Robbins must reverse the polarity of the ship's radar cloaking device, claiming that the external electric field can shock enormous seaweed. So, Captain Phillips gives Robbins permission to follow Hayes' suggestion. Robbins quickly does so, wherein they watch the giant seaweed detaching from Siren 2. Afterward, Rivera manually operates the ship to go up as the automatic pilot fails to respond. However, the giant seaweed left the ship's turbo intake clogged, making the controls hard to maneuver, which causes Siren 2 to fall toward a crevice on the rift floor. But before it happens, Hayes orders Robbins to help him overdrive the rotating blades and successfully lodges the ship into a crater to prevent its destruction. The crew thanks him for saving their lives. Due to Hayes' heroic action, Captain Phillips re-allows him to enter the control room. Meanwhile, Crowley notices that the fish jumps out of the tank and drown after exposure to the seaweed's highly poisonous chemicals. This prompts her to report it to Captain Phillips, saying that the seaweed's toxin level is extreme, stating her theory that its toxicity results from a complex group of mutations. A while later, Robbins finally locates the black box signal and is now locked in for retrieval. Therefore, he gets authorization from Captain Phillips to proceed to a deep water cave near the rift to retrieve the black box. Robbins and the rest of the crew begin piloting Siren 2 as they reach the cave through the narrow passage. Once they safely get into the subterranean cavern, he reveals that the signal is not a black box but an SOS, saying it is located inside the cave tunnel, and Hayes agrees as he shows them to the screen the scattered debris of Siren 1. Captain Phillips then calls a crew meeting in the mess deck. After that, he gives the order to put on protective suits complete with breathing apparatus since Crowley has warned them that the air outdoors is poisonous. The crew's official mission is to probe the site and learn more about the events in the underground passage. Upon getting outside, Hayes orders Kane to drop the raft overboard to get them through the tunnel's surface and reminds Fleming to operate the radar to read down the tunnel. Meanwhile, Robbins finally reads the radar and tells Hayes that the monitor only displays 90 feet at a time. Still, the crew proceeds to enter while Robbins guides their way. As they walk, Captain tells them there is a split tunnel, therefore the crew must divide into two teams. The first team composes of Fleming, Felipe, and Rivera, who are assigned to take the right tunnel. Then, the second team to get into the left tunnel is Carlo, Kane, and Hayes. During Team 1's exploration, Fleming gets paralyzed by a mutant creature that emerges from the wall's hole. Felipe and Rivera carry him out and fall back to the sub, but stop when the horrific creatures begin attacking them on the way out. Due to this, Rivera radios Hayes to come and help them out. In the meantime, Team 2 discovers several potentially lethal biochemical tanks and are preparing to investigate further when receiving the urgent call from Rivera. Back to Team 1, 
they use their underwater weapons to kill the mutant creatures when suddenly Rivera accidentally drops the radar unit which causes Robbins to lose sight of them on the monitor. Since that is the case, Team 1 proceeds to walk out of the tunnel but stops when Fleming begs Rivera to kill him due to the infection spreading throughout his body. She then shoots his head and keeps running only to have her leg grabbed by a mutant creature. While trying to save Rivera, Felipe is stopped as a second large creature slashes at his leg, killing him. At the same time, Team 2 has made it to the right tunnel where they discover Felipe's dead body. They also find out that Rivera is nowhere to be found in the tunnel. Hayes then receives a radio transmission from Captain Phillips, who reports that the SOS signal is approaching from ahead. Team 2 goes inside and finds a lab where they uncover the origin of the signal. No one is found to have survived, and the only clues they find are two data disks. Looking satisfied, Captain Phillips orders them to return to the ship. While in the engine room, Muller is ordered to inspect the oxygen regenerator when he notices the seaweed spreading throughout the room. He attempts to touch it, only to get killed by the seaweed's toxin. Francisco hears Muller scream inside and goes in to check on him, but only finds Muller lying on the floor covered with toxic algae. He gets frightened and immediately tells Captain Phillips and Crowley about it. Soon, the two arrive in the regenerator room and find Muller already dead. Crowley then orders Robbins to close up the aqueduct system so the seaweed doesn't get any bigger. Afterward, they approach Francisco, who is experiencing tummy ache after drinking the ship's water. Since the seaweed has already contaminated the ship's water, Captain Phillips separates Francisco in an empty room to keep him from spreading the infection. Meanwhile, the left probing crew members are about to enter the ship when a creature under the water suddenly attacks them and kills Carlo. Because of that, only Hayes and Kane safely return. Hayes then gives the data disk to Captain Phillips and lets him analyze it in the control room. A while later, Captain Phillips calls the remaining crew to watch the video from the data disk. They soon discover that the government has been developing biological weapons by producing new life forms from an experimental DNA accelerator. Hayes also confirms that what the tape has shown is true because his friend, Mark, was working on a prototype for Contact Company to give to the government. Technically, the government sends the Siren 1 through the rift to begin experiments in the tunnel. Then eventually, they realize that the biological weapons are the mutant creatures they came across and the accelerator still operates. With that in mind, Captain Phillips orders the remaining crew members, including Crowley, to destroy the accelerator so it can no longer create additional mutant monsters. The crew then exits the vessel, leaving Robbins on board as their guide. Once they reach the laboratory tunnel, they see amniotic sacs with mutants and encounter a giant horrific creature above. The crew then shoots it, but it gets Kane and kills him. Frightened, the remaining crew blows up the lethal biochemical tanks by shooting them, killing the giant horrific creature. Afterward, they completely destroy the accelerator and move out. Yet, as they paddle back to the ship, the crew notice that Robbins has closed the hatch. But Hayes manages to open it, and they safely get inside. Hayes then attempts to apprehend Robbins for his treachery, who shows up to them with a gun, revealing that he is the one who modified the computer system and framed Hayes. He also claims that the government hires him to kill everyone on board by detonating the siren too once they reach the rift, then leave using an escape pod. Once Robbins had finished spilling the beans, he shut them in a bio-laboratory where seaweed had grown up the walls and floors, telling them that he only created the black box signal to use it as bait. After he leaves, Hayes pulls the circuit microchip out of the regenerator and displays it on the screen for Robbins to see, telling him that he needs it to run the vessel and won't return it to the regenerator unless he lets them out. Robbins falls for Hayes' bait and opens the door, but Captain Phillips attacks him, drags him into a chamber, and attaches his face to the algae. However, he accidentally touches the mutated issue himself while fighting with Robbins. But Captain Phillips ignores it, shuts the door, and watches as Robbins succumbs to infection. Meanwhile, Crowley sees the microchip on the floor and shows it to Hayes, who tells her it is only junk used to mislead Robbins. Hayes then reconnects the power circuit, while Captain Phillips and Crowley activate the destruct sequence of the ship to seal the rift. Once done, they head to the pod, 
but Captain Phillips unexpectedly locks Crowley and Hayes inside the pod room. He then shows them his infected arm, indicating he will stay on the ship and detonate it once they leave. The movie ends with Hayes and Crowley using the escape pod to get to the ocean's surface after a harrowing battle with mutant creatures.